I get to talk to you a little bit about today, about, well, I thought of a few things. It's a relatively short talk, and so what I thought I would do is I'd start off by talking a little bit about how I work, because not everyone's going to be interested in infrastructure, although I'm going to try to make it interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, first, about here's how I figure out what I'm going to work on. Because I think some of, these, some of these techniques are good techniques to, to figure out what to work on and, and, and how to be working on things that are, that are relevant. Then I want to talk about three things that happen to be hot in my world right now that I think are big changes. And whenever you see big changes, what that means is big opportunity. So I'm going to talk quickly about networking, storage, and overall cloud computing. Some of why cloud computing is not just a fad, it's actually something pretty relevant and pretty big. It's going to stay big, and what that might mean for you. So that's the game plan. Um, we'll hopefully have a little bit of time for questions at the end, see how things go. All right, how we think about problems, or at least how I think about problems. I love cost models. It's kind of weird that it's supposedly a technical guy would love basically spreadsheet models driving my work. And it's, I would never start that way. But what's happened over the years is I've learned it's super easy to do great work on a problem that's just not that relevant. You got to work on the problems that are the most important. And that's one thing. The second thing that models teach us is, and I'll, show, I'll give you examples with this one because it's kind of fun. Um, models teach us that people don't look hard enough at things. What happens is people start to say something, and then you say something, and then three of us say something, and after a while it becomes true, and it's not true. It's phenomenal how many things I've managed to supposedly innovate by just not believing things. Just simply not believing things, checking to see if it really is true, and it's not. It's really, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's almost criminal. So listen, this is about big data centers, so think, Think order 50,000 servers in a single building. This is the cost model for building everything from the operating system on down. You can make a lot of mistakes building these models. The first one you can make is power you buy every month. It doesn't have any lasting value. Data centers last for 10 plus years. Networking gear usually goes four to five. Servers go three. You need some way to get that data together. If you do not normalize, you'll get confused and think the data center is by far the most expensive component in the whole system, and it's not. And so you've got to normalize. The way I normalize, boring, um, take the amortization period of the equipment, assume a zero residual value, which is pretty close to the facts in our world today, and 5% cost of money, and what do I pay every month? Once I know what I pay every month, I can compare it to power, and I can compare it to everything else I'm paying every month. So you're done at that point. A whole bunch of things interesting pop from this, but let's start with, let's start with how come people costs aren't there? All the enterprise customers I talk to say that people costs dominate their business. That's the most expensive cost they have. Administration is the most expensive cost they've got. It's not even here. And the reason it's not even here is because it's not even here. It's not relevant in the cloud. And the reason it's not relevant in the cloud is if you're managing 13 SharePoints, three Exchange servers, two Oracle servers, and a SQL server, you do it all by, by hand. You have no choice. You can't, you can't hire six people and, and, and automate each one of those operations. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. If you're managing 10,000 MySQL servers, or considerably more, hundreds of thousands of EC2 servers, well, first of all, if you were to try to do it using standard administration ratios, first of all, it, 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 you would never be able to hire that many people. It's just, you, you can't do it. And second of all, people make mistakes. And in very large numbers, rough numbers I use is people make mistakes about 20% of the time. It's not quite true. It's about one chance in five, one opportunity in five, an unintended consequence happens. Sometimes it's a net. Sometimes the entire data center gets disconnected. It's bigger than a net. People make mistakes, just a fact. And the more boring the work, the, the more the mistakes that they make. And so automation is a real helpful thing because it, it improves the overall reliability. And the second thing is it drives down the cost. Because of that, at a very high scale service, 3% administration is, is a pretty typical number. I've, you know, it's, it's easy to hit that one. And what that means is it's just not that important. So the first interesting thing that pops from this is I'm not even bothering to keep track of something that the enterprise says is the most important thing. And that's one way that cloud computing is wildly different from enterprise computing. 
Second one, the industry says, listen, the, the biggest non-people cost today, everyone's talking about power. Power is the hot issue. New York Times just did a couple day, a, a couple, um, day coverage on, on power. Number one cost in the data center, everyone's talking about how they can optimize power. We look at the spreadsheet and say, well, it's not number one. That's a disappointment. Everyone's, everyone said it's number one, not one, not one. Not two, it's not even two. That's totally disappointing. It's number three and it's not even a big three. So the first thing you get out of this is, there's a case where it's not quite true. And say, well, maybe it doesn't matter. Is it worth optimizing for power? It totally is. And so maybe it doesn't matter that you're getting it wrong and you think it's the most important, so it's actually the second most important. Well, here's an example why it's not okay. It's another, I think this is a cool thing, so it's worth sharing with you. The industry today thinks the way you deal with that, because power is the number one cost, and workloads, you buy enough hardware for the peak, but oftentimes there's troughs. And so you buy for peak, you monetize it at wherever the workload is right now. And it, one way to figure out the expense of, of supporting a workload is the ratio between peak and, and, and average actually tells you how efficient that workload is to, is to host. So we'll come back to that one. So if you're looking, if you're looking at, at that particular, you know, that's a fact, then the way you handle the troughs is you virtualize the servers, pack them onto the small uh, the workloads, pack them onto the smallest number of servers you can, and shut off all the remaining servers, you save all the power, that's the number one cost, it's a big win. Well, what you get from this is it's a 13% win. Now, you know, I've been known to do crazy things for 13%, so it's not disappointing, but it's only 13%. Another way to look at it, though, and way, a way that's productive here to look at it is you're wasting 87% because you still bought the server, you still bought the network, you still bought the power distribution gear, you didn't use it, you still bought the mechanical gear, but you're not using it, and you still bought the shell that it all exists in. And so what this tells you is, wait a sec, wait a sec, this is interesting. If I could run a workload, any workload, that was worth more than the, mon than the marginal cost of power, it would be a win. I said, I shouldn't be shutting these servers off. I should be turning them all on. If any workload in your company is worth more than 13%, than turn it on. That's super interesting. Hard to do, though. Say you're in tax preparation software. You've got a really busy time of year, and then you know, the rest of the year is just not so busy. Not much you can do about that. But in a cloud environment, we're bringing together a large number of non-correlated workloads. Two things happen that are cool. The first thing that happens is, a whole bunch of sinusoidal waves brought together flatten out. The aggregate wave is just flatter, it averages. And so the first thing is, the cost of supporting the aggregate workload, remember we talked peak to average, the cost of supporting the efficiency of the aggregate workload is wildly better than any individual workload. Super cool. That means that as a cloud provider, I win before I even start thinking. It's already way better. And when you're talking, when you're talking utilization, it's the biggest win there is because that's everything's being saved. If, you know, if, 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 if a, a standard enterprise customer could easily be in 10 to 20% utilization, which is to say everything's wasted 80 or 90% of the time, if you can bring that number up, it's, it's no higher lever there is. It's the most powerful lever there is. And so without even thinking, we've already got a more efficient aggregate workload. The second thing, and this is the thing, the fun thing that I wanted to tell you about, is what do you do with the trough that's remaining? The, the, little, the, the distance between the trough and peak, you're still some work, there's still some capability to run workload there. What do you do with that? Well, you make a market. You steal idea from every other, very, any other, every other business that runs very expensive assets, you, 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 you create a spot market and say, what would you pay me today to run workload for this hour that's not very busy? And it's, it's a super, it's a, one of these wonderful win-win-win things. It's customers say, well, I'll only pay you half of what you normally charge me. And here's the cool thing. Customer is paying less than the cost of, of, of what they're running. It's less than cost. And so wonderful, big win, huge win for a customer if they're happier in heck. Win for us, it's way more than the marginal cost of power. It's actually a win for us. So we're winning. And the, second, and the final thing is, all of the assets that are in play, the best thing you can do for the environment is, is, is utilize all the assets in play. And there's not, just not using them is the worst thing you can do. So that's the second thing that, 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 that kind of pops out from this. A couple more observations just from the model, just, the, just to kind of show you that the model is relevant and, and it's, a, it's a cool way to go after things. 
IBM and HP love to sell blade servers. They're a little bit more expensive, but you make it up in total cost of ownership. You say, okay, cool, that's great. So we turn, blades, we turn servers over 90 degrees. Apparently that gets better right up front. Then you pack them in really tight, so it costs a little bit more to cool them because it's a 25 kilowatt rack, so you're paying a little bit more to cool them. You're paying a little bit more to buy them, but you're gonna make it up over time. You say, well, let's just check the math. I'm gonna pay more on 57%, and I'm gonna spend a little bit more on the 18%, and I'm gonna save on the 4% because I'm gonna use less floor space. Uh-uh, not gonna happen. And that's why of the big players like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, you see zero blade servers sold. But the industry doesn't know that because, for, for what, because they just don't carefully inventory the costs, and so they're buying them. So last one, last one I wanted to pop from this one is I love looking at trends. Anytime you're working, anyth anything you're working on, when you see two things that relate to each other and they're moving apart, or two things that relate to each other and they're moving together, jump on it. It's an opportunity, it's a cool opportunity. Here's one that's moving apart, that's a problem. If you look at the aggregate IT workload, the IT, IT costs, all the servers, storage, and networking, the percentage that's networking is going up over time. So that says networking is a huge problem. Because something's broken there. And so you have to dig deeper there. And so let's start with digging deeper in there. Like that was an example. So let's, let's, let's dig deeper in networking. In the networking world, I'm comparing the ecosystem, because I'm claiming the ecosystem is broken, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about how it's being fixed right now. The ecosystem in the networking world is 1985 IBM. These are mainframe systems. It's exactly the same. You can compare them exactly um, layer by layer. The, the core of networking equipment, the CPU, is called an Application Specific Integrated Circuits, an ASIC. The ASIC is produced by a single vendor. The bent metal, the, 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 the router itself, is produced by a single vendor, same one that did the ASIC. The, protocol stack that runs on top of it, same vendor, it's all vertically integrated, just like an IBM mainframe. And what we need to have happen is what happened in the server world, is when we had competition at the CPU level, and you can, we don't have enough, but there's a little bit of competition at the CPU level, that's a good thing. And when you've got competition at the bent metal level, at the server level, and you can buy, for a given CPU, you can buy it from HP, from IBM, from Dell, dot, 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 dot. That's a good thing. And when there's operating system choice, you can run BSD, you can run a million different versions of Linux, you can run Windows, that's a good thing. And we know what happened to the server world. Costs plunged, the rate of innovation skyrocketed, it's a good thing. Same thing needs to happen in the, in the networking world. Well, the, the right equipment is there to actually make it happen today, and there's a ton of startup opportunities that are circling around networking right now because these opportunities are there, but the big players like Cisco and Juniper, it's hard to, for them to, to fundamentally change the way they do, the way they conduct their business, and 80% margins are hard to do in a commodity world. And so it may not be attractive for them to go after this. And so what happens is now you can buy ASICs from a wide variety of competitors, Fulcrum, Broadcom, uh, Marvell, several others. You can buy, take Broadcom as an example, you can buy a Broadcom reference platform router from Quanta, Celestica, Dell, NEC, DNI, and a whole bunch of others that I won't be thinking about right now. Lots and lots and lots of competition. Use op there's open source routing stacks like Quagga, and there's four fee routing stacks available from many players available as well. And so the right equipment is there to fundamentally change the world. And there's a need to change it. I told you one need, the costs are going up over time, so it's a problem. Anytime you see someone with, t with mammoth margins, that says this, this, something needs to change. Uh, second thing is, because networking gear is so expensive, we do another one of those dumb things. Let's return to our model. We know from the model that networking, although, believe it or not, a 128 port, 128 port router at 60% mar uh, markdown, because we're a big customer, so they give us a great deal. 60% markdown, it's still $350,000 for 128 ports. That's a big number. And by the way, for power, it takes 20 kilowatts. To give you a data point, a kilowatt, a kilowatt um, is, if you look at it, uh, a rack of, of servers, rough numbers, about 10 kilowatts. And so 20 kilowatts is a lot for 128 ports. Okay, so big opportunity going on in networking right now. 
Um, many layers of it, one, many drivers of it. I talked about one was cost. The second driver of it is the one that I, I just about got to but, but failed, is um, people make a mistake. The networking cost from the previous, mo from the previous model were, was about 8% of the overall cost in the, whole, in the whole system, but the equipment's ridiculously expensive. I told you it was $300,000 piece of equipment. So because it's so expensive, you want to get really good value from it, so you oversubscribe it and you do everything you can to optimize it, but it's crazy because it turns out the servers are 55%, and if you lower your, your server utilization by undersupplying the network, you're making a terrible mistake. And so as much as I hate paying $350,000 for a piece of networking gear, you almost have to if you're smart because you really got to get everything you can for the most expensive asset there. Now, it turns out you can do both. Um, the world's changing in network, so you can afford a lot more networking gear, which is what we're doing. And the world's changing in networking, and so you can use commodity components now and have competition and help the e healthy ecosystem. So that's actually going on. Another thing happening in the networking world is software-defined networking. Um, I discovered software-defined networking kind of by, by backing into it. It's an idea originally from Nick McEwen from Stanford University. I sort of backed into it, and I was working on a networking project with, with, um, with Albert Greenberg, and we were looking at, at the, rate of the rate of change inside a 50,000 server data center, and I'm, I've got a database background, and the rate of change is ridiculously slow. Like, instead of having this really complicated distributed system where every router is negotiating with every other router trying to form their op a collective opinion of what the connectivity graph is, you can just control it centrally. A single central database can do everything. If the transaction rate's ridiculously low. Now, you, it's not reliable enough to have a single database, so you have multiple of them, but it's not a hard problem. And the cool thing is you can do great work with very fast recovery time, um, guaranteed quality of service, segregating out different workloads, sorting, sorting workloads so that low priority um, updates that need to flow through the network any time in the next hour don't get in the way of high priority workloads. You can do lots to drive utilization up and do a better job of network, of ne network optimization if you essentially control. So software-defined networking really is a simple thing is central control of all the routing decisions is another thing that is becoming possible now. Another big startup opportunity, there's a whole bunch of companies that are working in this space right now. Uh, Nisera recently had a very large exit that, that was for relatively known, but there's a bunch working there. Okay, here's another one. Let's jump to storage quickly. On the storage side, um, we've been with DIS for a long, long time. I love to normalize data so you can compare two different, so you can compare unlike things. You saw that in my original model. On this one, normally when you look at disk, a commodity disk does around 80 to 100 IOs per second, and it does order, order 100 megabytes per second. And so they're not a comparable number, so you really can't, you know, you, you, you can't really figure out which is which. The cool thing is, what I've done is I've, to show what's going on, I've normalized IOs per second to, um, using 8K IOs, I've normalized them to megabytes per second. So they're both in megabytes per second. And what, it really, what this drives home is, you'll see the rate that sequential IO is improving on disk, and then you see the rate that, that random IO is improving on disk, and the answer is it's not. It's just flat not. So huge problem. We know what's going on. Um, here's a way to drive that problem home. Di um, what, this is it's kind of an interesting observation. If you look at a, at a four at a four terabyte disk, which is this year is going to be this that will be the sweet spot, a four terabyte disk. If you sequentially read it, read it, it will take 11 hours. That's a phenomenally long time. It's it's the closest thing there there is to tape, and it's kind of funny because Jim Gray said in, in 2006, disk is tape. It's true. It takes 11 hours to read every piece of every byte once. The wild thing is, if you randomly read it, it takes 41 days. You better have more than a month just to read everything a single time. So clearly it's not going to work. Um, so first observation is disk is still big. It's going to be tape. It is where we'll back up to, we'll archive to. It's a huge important business, but we will do zero random IOs to it because it makes no sense. It's just not the future. So first one is disk becomes tape. Second one is flash becomes disk. Semiconductor storage is capable of, of very large numbers of IOs. The problem is it's order four to six more expensive than, than disk at a capacity basis, but it's much cheaper for IOPS. 
So if you have an IOPS bound workload, which from the previous chart you know almost any random workload is going to be IOPS bound, everything's on flash. 100% everything, 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 everything is on flash. And if you play some cool tricks, you might be able to get more workloads on flash than would happen just naturally without change. And that's by observing flash has almost a, has a huge number of IOs. It has a number of IOs per gig that's, that is so high that few workloads actually need them. So if you can play games to trade off IOs, to, in other words, trade some IOs to gain capacity, and deduplication is one way of trading IOs to get capacity. Another one is compression and, and running a log structured block store. Another one is sparse provisioning. If you play some of those tricks, you can get, it, you can get the, the, the semiconductor storage approaching that of the cost of disk. And every time you get it closer, more workload goes that way. And so this is another one where I think there, there are a bunch of startups that, are, that have been wildly successful, and there's going to be a bunch more. Um, places where, where the biggest opportunities are right now are finding ways to get the costs per, per gigabyte down is, is, is one way. The second way is the reliability of Flash is plunging quickly. As we drive the cost out, the number of IOs that they can sustain before wearing out is going down rapidly, and the error rate's going down rapidly. And that's a great thing because it's amenable to software. It's, it's, you know, we, can, we can do things in software to hide all of those flaws, and if it's a hard problem it, and there's a payback, then it's worth, it's worth solving. Client storage, everyone knows this. It's migrating 100% to semiconductor storage as well, even though a lot of the workload is not random. It's all going semiconductor because there's a whole, all the advantages I've written here of I'm running in semiconductor. However, every client device is connected to the cloud, and every client device is only a cache for, 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 the, for everything that they're storing, which will be in the cloud. Because of that, it, it says a huge amount of the, of the client device storage probably still will be disk. It'll just be disk somewhere else. The cloud changes everything. This one is probably the, mo probably the most important one for me is that the cloud makes it possible to do startups without investing in infrastructure. Huge deal. But more than that, we, you know, all the advantages that I've been talking about up till now, all those optimization opportunities, all those tricks that we can play are possible here. So I'm going to cover quickly some of those and then talk about some of the opportunities that follow from it. First one, let me convince you on scale. The cloud is different on scale. I've talked about scale all my life. Every time I talk about scale, I'm always doing something bigger than last time. And so I think, well, I, that's, that's high scale. This one feels pretty high scale. This one feels like we really are high scale this time, is we're growing. I, I put this data together because I wanted to, I figured, I figured we would be growing at about an Amazon.com in the year 2000 every month. And if that was true, be, I think it'd be an impressive number. I think it'd be a big number. We're doing that every day. That means today we roll enough gear into data centers to support Amazon.com in the year 2000. That's a $2.7 billion company, not that small. And we'll do it again tomorrow, and then we'll do it the next day, and we do it on the weekends. <laughs> I don't know how they do that. It's a big deal. Here's another scrap of data. We don't release enough. We don't release enough data. But here's another interesting scrap. Look at those object counts. A trillion. What the heck is that? Think about this. Think about how many thousand servers in cross how many data centers it takes to store that many objects. It's a pretty phenomenal number. Every time I look at this, I kind of go, really? How about that? How about data centers? Here's the way Amazon works is we have those little boxes. Those little, those little boxes are, are regions. And each, one of those re and each one of those regions has multiple data centers. Inside a region, um, we have what's called availability zones. Each availability zone is, in fact, a data center. And the way we get redundancy and reliability, and the way we encourage you to get redundancy and reliability, is run your workload in multiple data centers in the same region. So you choose a region to get close to your customers. And once you, get, once you choose a region, then within a region, you replicate within the region. This is a totally different way than the way the rest of the world does redundancy. Most of the finance community has redundancy by having one data center in Phoenix and one data center in New York. And if there's a failure, then all the smart people get together and Phoenix is down, should we fail over to New York? Well, if we fail over to New York, we lose data. <laughs> That's tough. But if we don't fail over to New York, we lose, we lose availability. So all the smartest guys think hard and says, is it going to be down for an hour or a week? 
and we guess, and we guess wrong every time, and it's always going to be up in an hour, and it never is, and so we lose availability. That's just what always happens. So it really is. It really is. Because it, it always feels close. How could it possibly be down for more than an hour? It's impossible. It's been years. It's never had a problem. Always a bad day. So what happens, what happens in, in, the, in the availability zone model is you're doing synchronous replication between data centers that are only a few milliseconds apart, and it's synchronous. And so if, if data center B is having troubles, maybe, maybe it's not, we just think it is, kill it. it Cost nothing, just kill it. Kill the entire data center, shut down your whole capacity, fail over to another one, things go on. Because we can't predict we don't know the difference between good and bad. There's always gray failures. Good and bad's wonderful. Gray is terrible. Gray is terrible. And so you have to be wrong sometimes. This allows you to be wrong. You can say, okay, I think it's, I think it's probably broken, so shoot it. It's a great way to work. So believe it or not, it really is. Don't do it in your place. It's bad, bad. It's not general. Some of these ideas don't generalize. Okay. <laughs> Scale again. We, one of our postmortems, I think we got frustrated that somebody was talking about Amazon's Virginia data center was down. And so we, we, I think we wrote up that it was actually more than 10. We didn't say how many, but there was more than 10 data centers in Virginia. So one part of one tenth of our capacity was down. That's, I think, the point we're driving home. Okay. What else can I tell you? We're tight on time because I'm having too much fun up here. Let me, say, let me go quick then. First biggest gain, the, the most powerful lever we already, we already covered this is utilization. I already told you the tricks we can play in the cloud to drive utilization. Trick one, aggregating non-correlated workloads. It's no brainer. It just does the right thing for you just magically. Second thing is create a spot market to fill the trough. We do that with, with, with EC2. So utilization is the most powerful lever and we can do cool things with it. What else can we talk about? Data center efficiency. Industry average data center efficiency is rough numbers. Every time a watt's delivered to a server, roughly one watt is wasted. That's rough efficiency. It's not a great number. It's, it's not a great place to be. But for companies like us that do nothing except study this problem and hire people to go after this problem, it's a better number. And so when we deliver a watt, we waste about 0.2 watts. It's a, big, it's a different place to be, and it makes total sense. If you only do one thing, and you, all you hire for is people that know how to do those things, and all you try to drive innovation on is innovation in that area, it works. And so this is the second advantage. It's the data centers are a heck of a lot better. We're building, most companies build two data centers in their entire careers. We, we'll, we'll do more than two in the next few months. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, because things are happening at a greater rate, it means the cycle time between idea and trying it and saying not quite right and changing it and, and building the next one is so fast, it drives innovation. And that's why things are changing faster. The reason why you're hearing so much about data center um, designs right now is the, the pace of innovation is wildly faster than it ever been before. All right, hardware scale effects. Hardware companies buy from original design manufacturers. They, they take the gear, they ship it over, they, they ship it into the channel. The channel takes 30%. Eventually, it works its way through the channel, and a customer gets it. The customers have paid for the, for, the, for the fact that there's thousands and thousands of customers, and so there's a complicated distribution channel. When there's 10 cloud providers, they buy directly from the original design manufacturer. We design servers for, if we're gonna run tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of a workload, the server's designed to support that workload. I don't care if it can run nothing else. It's just that workload is what it's gonna run. It's gonna run it super well. We're gonna optimize for that workload and we're gonna buy directly from the manufacturer that builds that system. It's more efficient. You'd just be crazy to think otherwise. And people say, well, I think actually, I think actually my, my Inefficient data center that I built in, in 1989, buying servers from IBM with this complicated distribution channel is probably, I think it's more efficient than, than cloud computing. I'm pretty sure. I've done the, I built the model. It's like, really? I mean, honest? And oh, and all their suppliers are making 80% margins. You look up, you look up, you look up Amazon's margins, and they're single digit, and you look up enterprise software companies, and they're 80%. I mean, it's just, really? It's, it's cheaper doing that? It's, it'd, be, it'd be surprising. You know what's cool? Here's a cool one. Here's a cool one. Last one. We've had 19 price reductions so far. It's, I worked 
I've worked in enterprise software companies for my entire career, 20-something years. I have never had a price reduction. This is bizarre. Who's, whatever? We have, we have price reductions. We have price reductions where we have no competitors. Think about that. There's, there's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's spooky, and, we, and it's normal. What we do is we work like heck to drive, the, to drive the cost down. Every time we drive the cost down, we pass some of it on to customers. We think it's the right thing to do for customers, but it is, at least for me, it's spooky to be reducing prices in some areas where we don't even have competition. And so um, it's kind of a good thing. I'm pretty sure it's a lot more efficient. It makes it a lot of fun for someone like me to work in a place like that because the rate of change is so great. And it means that we're constantly you know, delivering more value to customers, which is kind of fun. All right. Let's see if we can. Last slide. I think it's important, I'm, but it, it goes like this. One of the concerns with AWS, if you're working in the startup community, is, well, geez, AWS, they do everything by, by hand. They do, they, they, how could I ever sell anything to them? And it's true. We, we don't buy a ton of companies. But there's an interesting factor going on. Because cloud computing is as big as I told you, and it really is that big, there's going to be a huge number of providers. Every colo provider has to be in cloud computing. Every telco provider has to be in cloud computing. There's going to be hundreds and th or thousands of providers of cloud computing. If we do something ourselves and don't buy it, sometimes we will, but if we don't buy it, if we do it ourselves, what that means is every other provider has to respond and do something. This is actually, that's what I'm calling the second tier effect. It drives a lot of opportunity. If we do a cool storage device like I described to you earlier for flash storage, then great, build that idea. There's a whole bunch of companies that just suddenly developed a very big need to get that. And so there actually is quite a bit of opportunity here. So that's what I wanted to cover with you. Thanks very much. I, I appreciate it all of your time and, uh, and enjoyed chatting with you. I'm guilty. Okay. Thank you so much. That was that was great.